All right, guys, we are here. I'm sorry for the ice cream sound in the background. I guess the truck is going by. But um, we are here. This is an episode we've been working on trying to get done, and finally we uh, locked in our schedules. But um, this this episode, it, it makes a lot of sense for me to doing it now anyway because, um, you know, it's going to be primarily about mental health. And I kind of had, I don't know if an episode is the right word because it wasn't that bad, but you know, I had a day, and we'll, maybe we'll get into it, but it, I just had this moment of just random depression, and I didn't know why, and I was just confused and frustrated, and, um, but anyway, like, it, it makes sense, because I've been kind of going up and down with my own mental health, trying to figure out certain things, and, um, we got this woman on who's just a very kind person, and just, you know, she's just trying to get her message out and share her story, and, um, you know, I think her and I will have a lot to, to talk about. Anyway, uh, would you like to, uh, you know, tell us your name and a little bit about yourself? Yes. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Dorina Perche. Um, I am a small business owner. I started a company called Zoji, trying to advocate uh, digital balance for kids. And also, I'm a disabled veteran, um, a caregiver. I take care of my brother that's had brain damage from a stroke. And so I'm juggling those three balls, and I can tell you with my own mental health, um, it is very challenging. Um, Sometimes I think, did I not think this through when I decided to launch my business in July of uh, 23 after uh, retiring in 20? But here I am, and so hopefully um, I'll be able to share some things that have helped me to navigate through the dark side of my anxiety and depression. Yeah, for sure. I do remember reading that about your brother. Um, and weird enough is you, is you brought that up because, um, I, one of my, my other job is to help people with disabilities find employment. And the other half of that job is also advocacy. And we were down at the uh, state Capitol about a month ago and we were fighting for caregivers, care attendants, Um, to make more money. Um, I don't know what it's like in Maryland, but here in Pennsylvania, their wages are around 12 to 15, and 15 is usually the high. Um, And they get get paid very poorly, and they get very bad benefits, um, very little time off, if any. Um, I don't know what it's like for you, but um, that was something we were fighting for about a month ago. Mm Mm-hmm. Well, here in Maryland, um, I haven't applied for any caregiving because my brother, he is independent in the sense that his brain does allow him to perform his activities of daily living. Like he can bathe himself. He can stay and live with himself independently. In fact, that really helped him after I nurtured him to health. I felt like as a man, he needed his manhood back in some kind of capacity because he's not able to drive. He's not able to. Uh, think critically or make any decisions. So I have to do all the financial decisions. And so um, it's been it's been challenging. Um, it has challenged my mental health in so many ways, especially when he forgets stuff, because one of my symptoms with my um, depression is that um, I also experience problems with judgment and memory. And so, but with him, I think because of the vulnerability of his situation, it forces me to stay focused because I know that if I make a mistake, it can really hurt him, whether it's financially or his health, because I have to put it together, his medications, uh, stay on top of his doctor's appointments. So in some regards, um, helping my brother And that capacity is also helping me because it's making, it's forcing me to be mindful of everything that I do, which in turn is really helping my mental health. Sure. Well, I mean, it's got to feel good to take care of somebody you love um, and bring them joy. But also, I mean, it's, it's much harder to worry and care for someone else than it is yourself. Because when you're yourself, it's like you'd, a lot of times you would rather endure the pain because it's like you know how it feels. You, you, you may or may not know how to take care of it. Um, but when it's someone you care about and you see them in agonizing pain or you see them emotionally distraught or whatever, you start to, I mean, it, you feel helpless. 
and you know so i can only imagine i do feel helpless i feel helpless in a different way though um because i'm the only girl um you know people often say oh you're such a good sister and i'll tell them quickly um i don't feel like i'm a good sister because i'm not doing this for him because i'm his sister um if i really had a choice i'd rather not do this because it is Sometimes it's mentally draining on me and it makes me very anxious, especially when I can't reach him on the telephone. I get very anxious and we've had episodes of that and I don't like it. Um, I chose to do this for my brother because no one else in my family stepped up. My brother is not married. He has no children. And I know putting my brother in an institution, I might as well say he's dead, to be honest. I know that sounds blunt, but it's like I might as well kill him because he's not going to thrive. He's a very social person. And so I'm very happy that I found a independent um, complex where he has he's surrounded by other people with disabilities and he's thriving. He's building friendships. And I finally got him a pet that he can have. So even though he's not able to live totally independent, mean make all his decisions, um, he's happy and I'm happy in seeing him happy. And thusly, I feel like I made the right decision yeah. in honoring this. For sure. Yeah. And that's, that a challenge in itself because I know for me, I'm really big on like purifying like my mental bubble and just getting rid of all the negativity and anything that brings me, any kind of pain in life. Um, and obviously with this particular situation, someone you care about and, you know, you don't want to see him go to some sort of home or institution or anything. So you kind of have to take the, the bad with the good. And obviously you get more good from it, but there is some bad that comes with it. And it, it, it's kind of humbling to, to hear you admit that. Cause there are a lot of people that wouldn't even admit that out loud because it's like, well, it's my brother, of course. But I mean, look, it's not easy. And, and, and for you to sign up for that, you have to accept that this is going to bring you some sorrow. This is going to bring you some, you know, stress and, and anxiety. So, mm-hmm. you know, and, and when you have depression and anxiety, it's like you want to kind of alleviate that. You don't you want to kind of completely get away from that. But in this situation, you can't. You have to. I mean, you, I mean, I guess you can disown them and, and whatever, but that's I mean, I don't think that's in the cards for you so (laughs) no (laughs) i think it would bother me honestly my anxiety would kick in and say oh you were so awful you know you could have helped your brother you didn't have (laughs) that little talking head would be just going on and on and so i think i think i made the right decision yeah for sure and i I think yeah and i think there's gonna there'd be a lot of guilt and I, I wouldn't be surprised. You know how karma is and how life is. I wouldn't be surprised that you would bump into a lot of people that are probably in your brother's situation and you would see something in them that would, re- and, and maybe their situation, maybe even worse off. And they would remind you of, oh man, look, my brother. And you would just sit there and cry or be angry. And, you know, it's sometimes life has a good way of reflecting some of the things that you, uh, you screwed up on. That's true. And, you know, one of the things, too, I think, for um, my brother um, that segue into my own life, um, prior to my brother having his stroke, we had a conversation about him moving uh, back to St. Louis um, because we both reside here in Maryland. And he could name he named all these people. I said, if you were to become ill, you know, or something happens, you have a, you have a support system. He started naming all these people that he believed that will be there for him. And who would have thought a year later after that conversation, he would have a brain stroke and where are those people? And so that what made me think of that is the vulnerability um, in helping my brother. I see my own vulnerability as a person with mental health because I have been hospitalized uh, with suicidal ideations and things over the past. And found myself alone because I was ashamed to share with even close friends at that time of my mental health because of the stigma that people have and how they brush you away. And so when I look at his vulnerability, I'm also having to wrestle 
with my own vulnerability that if something were to happen to me where my serotonin were to drop to the point where I can't talk, I can't self talk my way out of it, that I need to be, you know, checked in a hospital and get myself back to that level. Yeah. Will there be someone there for me? And I really don't know. I mean, I have a few friends that I've talked about my mental health, but I really don't know. And that's, I think I'm not the only one out there that struggle in wondering, do I really have that support system that if I go into crisis, I have someone that will create a safe space where I can tell them I'm in crisis. Um, I have, you know, shared with friends that if I repeat myself about something I'm dealing with over and over, that's a signal that I'm, I'm having an anxiety episode. Sure. Um, and so, yeah, vulnerability is very real when we live in a society that's not quite ready to normalize mental health in a sense of allowing us to have the safe space to say, I'm hurting right now. I need help. I, I just want you to listen to me. I just need to talk it out or, or I need to go, uh, will you come walk with me or will you just hold my hand? Um, I hope that we can have that safe space and we won't have to, for those that are like me, wrestle with the vulnerability of wondering if I were to find myself in an episode, episode where there's no one there, yeah. how would that work its way out for me in a very safe and supportive way? Sure. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, and, uh, I was talking to somebody earlier about this, and it, it's some of it's very hard to talk about because when you're going through it, and let's say you hit rock bottom mentally, you know, where you're you are suicidal, um, or you know, either maybe you either act out trying to hurt yourself, whether it's cutting, whatever, or taking meds, or whatever you do, um, or you're just you're just in the midst of it and you're thinking about hurting yourself, and it, it's it's easy to just say, yeah, okay, yeah, I want to hurt myself, but it, it's how and, and why and, um, you know, all the things that come with it, all the hatred and, and all the evilness that kind of comes from it. Sometimes it's very hard for people to share because it's like, oh, I'm, oh, they're just going to think I'm crazy or I'm, I'm a, I'm a awful, just evil person. And the reality is we're all, you know, we all have the ability to be evil depending on experiences and just what happens to us. But sometimes it's just, it's not controllable. There's times we're just in the midst of our problems and mm -hmm. just whatever thought creeps in. Like I was saying to start the show is where I was, I was literally sitting on my, sitting in my recliner watching a show. And then I just had this like overwhelming, like dark cloud come over me and just go, Oh, you're lonely. And I just started feeling depressed. I didn't cry or anything, but I just sat there and just, started feeling all droopy like what's I'm like what the hell like is it a, it's it, it's middle of a Sunday I was fine and all of a sudden now I'm just feeling lonely and I get it I do so I do have some loneliness in my life but it, it it still made no sense I couldn't figure out the source but like I said sometimes there may not be a real answer and, and a lot of people mm -hmm. don't know how to like just without just looking at somebody for face value and just go, well, you're just crazy. It's like, no, man, I'm, I know I'm not crazy. I'm just, I don't know. Life just kicks you around and, and sometimes it just, you just go through it emotionally. And um, Well, I know with me, when that happens um, with me, um, I really go into self-talk mode. And what I mean is that sometimes I find myself in front of a mirror and I, I talk to myself. Now, someone may think that's crazy, but I talk to myself and I may say, girlfriend, what's going on? Come on, talk to me. What's going on with you? And looking at myself in the mirror and just talking it out uh, about what I think is going on with me and everything. I'm not having a two-way conversation like, hey, that's right. crazy. Yeah. No, nothing like that, but just saying affirmations while looking at myself. And then I, I sometimes also would write out a plan like, okay, so you're feeling this way. What do you think is going to help you to feel better? And then sometimes I write things out. I find that very helpful for me. Uh, but I think the whole experience is being mindful 
of what I'm experiencing, even if I don't know the un- the the reason behind it, but I know what I'm feeling is very real to me. Yeah. And I don't want to stay in that situation. So I have to be mindful in acknowledging it. And sometimes I will say, okay, you know, let's, let, let's feel what we feel for 30 minutes or an hour. And then some might say, well, what happens if you're still feeling that way? Then I'm just, you know, unless there's something pressing in my life, I'm going to allow myself to feel what I feel and whatever that feeling that I can or write down in words, I'm going to capture that in words. And, and then I like to circle back sometimes and just read what I wrote because intuitively, sometimes we speak to ourselves. Our inner voice is trying to speak to us, but because of all the noise and the distractions, we're not able to hear. And so I do believe that sometimes uh, we should allow ourselves to, to listen to our inner voice and find out why is it telling us these things, especially with anxiety, because anxiety so, sort of sometimes tell you a lot of negative stuff. Yeah. And you, it, it's, it's not real, but you believe it's real. Sure. And sometimes, you know, um, I listen and I dissect it. I write it down and I meditate. You know, um, but I think the main thing is what you did. You acknowledged that something wasn't right. You could have just said, oh, and kept on trying to force yourself to continue to watch that uh, program. But we all know that sometimes we can't even force it. It just overshadows us and we have to acknowledge it and know when to get help when help is needed. And then the other times know how to manage it and try to continue to live a good life for ourselves. Yeah. Good thing, like, when these things happen, you know, as as I feel like I'm I'm a veteran at this now because when I deal with it, even if it doesn't go away that second or within even that day, I'm pretty sure the next day it's going to go away. Whereas years ago, it would have lingered for months, weeks for sure. And, um, now it's just, it's a quick bounce back. So I know that I'm very resilient and I can, I can handle it. It's never like, oh my God, like it wasn't like, oh my God, you're lonely. You know what? It was a good idea. Let's just go end our lives. It's never even gets close to that, which I know it's progress. And I know I've, I've, I've moved on and I know I'm, I'm much better than where I used to be. It's just these sudden random moments of negative thoughts out of nowhere that just kind of derail my day. It's like, ugh, like why, why are we doing this? But yeah, there's many ways I use to combat it. Whether it's exercise, um, I know I started writing things down on the board to to procrastinate less. I'd say anything I put on this board, I have to make sure there's a check mark next to it because I have to do it that day, even if it's mm-hmm. you know text you to do the podcast or do the podcast or wash dishes or you know do my cat's litter, whatever it is. If it's on the board that day, I got to do it. And that just helped me be a little more disciplined, a little more uh, consistent. Um, I like that. I have to adopt that because I I think uh, I got to touch with it. What is it? ADHD? Okay. Yeah, I think we all have that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, think I'm a, a part, I think it's a lot of us that's undiagnosed walking around here as themselves because I can be all over the place. And I remember one day last week, I don't know, I was feeling a sense of loneliness and I find that sometimes um, I want to be by myself and I'm struggling with why I don't want to talk to people on the phone or uh, go places. I just want to be home. And at those times, I don't necessarily feel um, any anxiety or depression. And I don't know if it's because of the attention that I have to give my brother that maybe subconsciously I just want that time for myself, some time for myself to relax. And so um, I think I was Netflix out, Hulu out and all of them. So what I decided to do, I put some uh, music on my favorite um, reggae and I just started dancing, just started dancing and I started feeling better. You know, I'm still in the house by myself. Um, but it lifted me up because I found something that helped me to um, lift my spirit up because it was something that I enjoyed. And then dancing, you can have fun dancing, even if it's by yourself, I guess. 
Sure. Um, but loneliness is something that it's just something that um, that comes and goes, um, and sometimes I don't, I don't know what triggers it. Yeah. But I know it's real, yeah. and I know it can come to you, and you can be in a room with a bunch of people. Oh, and yeah. still feel like they're so far away. I've said that before. You can be in a room with a thousand people and still feel alone. It doesn't matter. Yeah. It makes mm-hmm. it doesn't make a lot of sense to people, but when you don't feel when you feel out of place, you don't feel like you have a place to go and to be yourself when you feel like everybody's just enjoying their self and you're unhappy, it's like, why am I unhappy? Am I the problem? Are all these people the problem? Um, yeah. And you just, your mind just starts going down this spiral and you're like, I don't. And, and it, it's kind of like being in the same thing, but being in a room, being sober around a bunch of drunk people is that mm-hmm. you're, you're unhappy and they're all, I mean, well, on the surface, we don't know what they're really dealing with, but they're out to have a good time. And you're kind of the drip. You're the one sitting there. Even if people aren't paying attention to the fact that you're down, you, you inherently feel like you are and yeah, it's really, it, it sucks because you're just like, man, I'm the problem. And like I said, m- most people, or if any of them, aren't even really paying attention to the fact that where you're at. But you feel it, and that's all that matters. And it's in your head, and it just continues to grow and grow. And you're like, oh, my God, this, I hate this. I just want to go home. Why did I come out? I mean, <laughs> and you know why you came out, because you know a lot of your demons tend to sleep at where you live, and that's where your comfort zone is. So it's like, you're trying to push yourself. You're like, I want to go out. Okay, I'm out. Now I'm even, I'm, now I'm just more anxiety ridden, because I'm in an unfamiliar territory. At least now in my home, I could just curl up and, you know, bury my head into a pillow. But here, I'm just stuck. And yeah, it's, it's, it's really unfortunate. Uh, and then also, too, do you ever struggle with the sensitivity? I struggle. Like, I went to a jazz Christian concert. I was sitting there listening to the music, really enjoying myself. And my girlfriend's uh, companion said to me, are you are you enjoying yourself? You kind of look mean. And I was like, yeah. oh, my gosh. So then I started getting into the anxiety mode, thinking about, okay, what am I doing? How should I put my face? Should I just sit here like I'm smiling all the time? Why can't I just be relaxed? I mean, right. I can't help if I relax my face with serious. I might just started going through all this mental. Yeah. And it was like, and then I came to the conclusion. I was like, why did he just shut up? Now he got me all in my head. I, uh-huh. I can't even enjoy the music because I'm wondering how my face looks. Uh-huh. And so I asked myself, um, I think that's another reason why I avoid people in gatherings because I don't want people to be judging me that I'm not looking the way they think I should look and they interpreting it wrong. And then I go through this um, thought process. Um, it's almost like OCD. I tell people, you know how people have OCD when they have things combined in thoughts. I have looping thoughts over and over and over and over again. Same thing, looping, looping. Right. And so I try to wrestle with that sensitivity. And I think the thing for us is that when people misspoke about, misspeak about something about us and we know it's not true, just tell our inner voice, you know what? They got it wrong. Yeah. They got it wrong and remain authentic. Mine is more when it comes, and this is something most people, no one's ever said to me, but when it comes to being sensitive is, is I want to always give off good energy and a good like vibe and aura because, you know, there's so much negativity in the world. There's so many people that are just impatient and they just don't care about holding the door for an old person or whatever. And I try to really be positive energy no matter where I'm at. I always say the grocery store because I'm always there, but you know, wherever it is, whether it's at work or wherever I'm at. I really, I try to just brighten up other people and be positive and and chipper and just, you know, whatever. I try to be cognizant of that, but I know there has been moments where I'm like, man, am I really the one that's sucking the energy out of the room right now? Because I don't want to be that, but I feel down. I feel depressed. And I'm one of these people that kind of wears my emotions on my sleeve. Um, If I'm not talking and I'm avoiding people, it's not because I don't like you. It's because I'm probably depressed and I don't want to take my problems out on you. Um, Mm -hmm. And so I I, but I don't want to be that because I'd rather be, you know, this like bright, you know, vibrant energy in the rooms. And I'm, I'm not like the most outgoing person, 
But as long as you feel that like, hey, you're not in danger and, you know, this guy is just goofy and wants to have a good time and is just trying to make you smile because, you know, you know what I'm going through. I got my own issues and you probably have yours, but we're still going to smile. We're still going to get through this day and, and, and wake up tomorrow, hopefully. Um, but I, yeah, that's, I'm more cognizant of that, of just being and you know, a good vibe and a good energy in the room. Cause you know, I, I, I'm sure, you know, you know, this. like, you've been around people where you feel their energy and you, you, if there's energy, you feel where you're like, Ooh, I think you're just evil or a mean person, but there are just people like when you're around them, you're like, Ooh, I don't know what it is about you, but something that's coming off you is just doesn't feel right. Um, and I never want to be like that. And I'm sure I have. Uh, and maybe that's in my head. I don't know. But that's something I'm I'm really more like sensitive towards because I just want to be a good energy, good positive energy for people. And I understand that. And I think for me, um, being retired um, and being in uh, my early 60s, I sort of feel like I've had to wear a mask just to have a career or good living. But I feel like I'm transitioning to a, a stage in my life where I just want to be authentic. I want to enjoy peace. So if I have a day that I'm not struggling with migraines, I'm not struggling with my anxiety and other um, military issues that I have, it is such a good day. And I want to maintain that day of goodness. And so I really am very mindful of what people say to me. Now, and, you know, even if they try, oh, you're being sensitive. And I'll just say I'm not. I just don't like how you describe me. Uh You know, like, for example, my companion and say, oh, you you know, if I forget something, oh, you're always forgetting. And then before I used to just let it roll off me. And for now, I'm like, you know, that's not true. So please don't say that. Just only apply to the conversation we're having now. And so I guess I say I'm. Be trying to be authentic and establish boundaries that I know uh, that won't trigger me because um, I haven't been on medication since 2015. Okay. Should I be on medication like I had in a previous conversation with you? I probably should, yeah. but I'm trying to manage it in a holistic way. I'm not against medication because medication has helped me. I'm just trying something different because I don't have the stress of a job anymore. Uh, I need to do my business doji part time. And so I'm trying to do things in a more holistic way, like watch my diet, I exercise um, and everything like that. But I am open to if those things no longer serve me, that keeps me balanced. I have no problem saying, introduce me to some meds because I'm feeling a little loopy here and mm-hmm. I need to get my balance. So medication is good. I just, for some reason, uh, trying to do it in a very holistic way. And some days um, I drop the balls on things and I have to find my way to pick them up. But it's like you, it doesn't last for a long time where I've had to say, you know what? I think it's time to go on meds. I think it's more time like, okay, you know, you're tired, you haven't rested or different other things that I can point to, to try to uh, get me back balanced. Sure. No, absolutely. Yeah, no, I understand. I mean, that's like, everybody has their own methods and and forget just mental health, anything. People turn to religion, people like exercise, whatever, whatever it is that you do. I don't ever begrudge anybody if they want to start a holistic you know, way of doing it. That's fine. And, and, and that works for you. That works for a bunch of people. Some people, they can only do medication. Some people do. They, again, I, I think there should be these many different options. I just wish, I think we have too many now because now we don't know what's real and what's fake, especially when it comes to like supplements and all that, because, and even exercise, like there's a trillion different exercises. They'll say, well, no, they don't do that because this doesn't burn fat the right way. And this, it's just like, oh my God, can we just get to a point where we just know what is what and what isn't? Um, but I think it's, that's, that's the thing. That's what makes us so different in, in so many ways is that we, there are things that work for you that just won't work for me. It may be a life changer for you. Just doesn't work for me. And that's okay because what works for me probably doesn't work for you. And, you know, that's just life. I but, think that's a good part too. I think having this discussion, 
um, someone may say, oh, well, I could try that or I can try that. So I think when I think about the times when I was on medication, I was on so many trying to find the right one. Well, it's the same way when I'm trying to try it holistically, trying to find the right fit, because it may work for me today or now, but maybe next year it doesn't work. And I think the thing about the whole process of finding what works for you is making sure you're authentic in your decision making and not letting other people, I say, influence you of on what they think is best. Because even doctors can do that. They can say, oh, this is good for you. And I've done that and it didn't work out. And I kind of had some hesitation about it because I know my health. I know how things are. But because they'll say, oh, well, this is good for you. You should try it. And I'll ask. But now I'm more open to where I can have a discussion with a doctor and say, well, let's look up this medication. Well, this medication says it does X, Y, Z. Well, I can't take that medication because of my other conditions. So sure. my thing to you is whether you're talking to a clinician or you're trying something holistic, make sure you look at every aspect of your life to make sure that's not going to knock you off balance while you're trying to help, you know, solve one issue over here. And then it, it messes up everything on the other 99% or whatever. Just yeah. balance and be authentic and hold yourself accountable. I think even with our mental health, we still should hold ourselves accountable on the type of life that we're trying to live. Like you told said earlier, you have a board, you put your goals on there, you want to see a check. I think that's a good idea. I think I'm going to adopt that because I think it will keep me focused. So thank you for that tip. Sure. Um, I think it's just a trial and error. And I think it's okay to um, try new things or say, nope, I don't want to do that. This is your life. This is your journey. Um, the main thing I say is that if you are experiencing any type of mental health or any disability, it's okay to own it. It's okay to navigate through life to find out what is best for you. Sure. So you can live a happy, prosperous life. Absolutely. And just so you know, I use a dry eraser board. That's because it's, it's mm -hmm. the best method. But um, I know something I wanted to ask you because I do have a lot of friends who are, are black and, and, and they, you know, they, they talk about different, you know, because there's different cultures and, and, and whatnot. Did you run into any kind of problems you know explaining or um you know coming forward with coming forward with talking about your mental health because i know there's different taboos and whatnot and oh yes yeah, yeah. um in the black community i don't know if it's still the same way but when i was growing up because i'm a 60s baby when i was growing up we were told that uh, christians do not get depressed and so that was one of the reasons that I suffered with mental health in my 20s and was ignoring it because of that. I would say, oh, no, Christians don't get depressed. It was a, um, I sort of got away from that. I had a, um, a white female psychologist, um, and she had told me how I had a chemical imbalance and how I was just all over the place, and I told her my story. And she said, well, what about if someone had hypertension or how about if diabetes? And at that time, she's saying, well, your medicine, you need your medicine to keep your serotonin because your body doesn't keep your serotonin level. And so when she explained it to me in a medical sense, that set me free. That now if I hear pastors say something about Christians don't need to get depressed, I just ignore it. And if I come across black uh, people who are struggling with mental health, I tell them it's okay to get help. This doesn't take away who you are. Um, and so I do feel like more and more um, black people are starting to seek mental health. I don't think it's that same level of taboo sure. when I was growing up. Um, I think a lot of people are starting to be more and more open yeah. to mental health individually. But I think, we need to be open collectively to let people know safe space because when Simone Biles had admitted that, you know, um, she was having some issues with her mental health, let me tell you something. As a black woman, to say that openly to the world, uh, that took a lot of courage. And I'm so happy she did because even though people pushed back on it and said she should have done it, 
and all this other stuff. But I think her acknowledgement probably set some people free to say, wow, she's on top of her game, but yet she has the mental health. I can be successful and still have this illness too. I have to do just like she does. I have to recognize it and manage it. Sure. And I, I think even you not to stand out too long, but like, I think when you, when you see like the inner city and you see all these kids who are trying to avoid the traps and being in gangs and whatnot, you're trying to tell me they don't have anxiety or depression, like, or the grandmas that are taking care of them or the, or the, the single mothers, like you're trying to tell me there's no depression in that. Like you, of course, but it's just, that's why I wanted to, like, I wanted to address it just cause you know, there's different culture barriers and, and some people may well, not. A lot of the- I will tell you a lot of the things that are negative that are going on um, in the black community. Some of it really is mental health and the trauma of uh, whether it's poverty, racism. Um, Some people do not have the equipment to fight through it like others. I mean, I've encountered racism before, but it never hit it never penetrated me to a point where I want to do something destructive to someone else or even destructive to myself. And, um, I think I, I think that's because of the good counseling that I received, uh, from the VA as well as my Christian upbringing and my mom. But some people do not have that support system, so they don't know how to control their emotions and they act it out. And then some people, uh, do things, let's just say some people do things because they just gain pleasure of doing negativity. Oh, yeah, yeah. You know? And they'll label it as mental health because you do something bad, you must have a mental health. Yeah. No, they just want, they have, they take pleasure in doing that. And no counseling, no nothing may not even help those type of people. And those are far and few, though, I think, but they're out there. Right. Or it is mental health, but you're still going to prison. You can't use that as an excuse. Yeah. That's what it is. Um, did you, I, I don't remember what you came to promote. Do you have a book or is it? A- Actually, um, I have a card game. Um, card I had game. a dream about a, a quick, uh, fun card game called Dramatic Shift. That's the brand. Um, and so it's a game designed for digital kids because it's quick and it's fun. You can play around in less than 10 minutes. And I think it's a useful tool to help parents to encourage screen time break for children because I don't think a lot of parents know that too much screen time can lead to anxiety and depression for kids as well as adults. And so um, it's, I think post COVID we need to rebuild our children's social skills because some of them are acting out over what happened in COVID and they're not being engaged. And so if parents can have games such as mine and other games that they can say, hey, time out from the social media or YouTube. Let's sit down and connect as a family or let's play with your friends yeah. so they can continue to build their social skills. And so um, it's been, that has been a struggle too. You know, trying to start a business when you have mental health is very hard because when things do not go as planned, you internalize it as if it's something wrong with you or you may find like there are days I just don't have the drive to do the things that I should do. And I used to beat myself up over it, but now I do not. Um, I only do it part time. Uh, My game is at Walmart. And so, um, but it is designed to encourage kids and parents to connect. And so to continue to build their social skills and the fact that it's, uh, quick is because kids like that quickness, that stimulation. Yeah. And so the game offers that type of stimulation like digital uh, because they don't know who's going to be the last player holding a card because it's opposite of Uno. You have to be the last player holding a card to win the game. It's kind of like reverse old maid. <laughs> you don't want to be stuck with the old lady card. Um, yeah. But no, I, I, I I know what you mean. Like for me, I like when I started doing this, I I realized, you know, I have these moments where I just, I don't want to be as productive. So I said, you know what, what I'm going to do is I'm going to record a bunch ahead of time. 
So if I ever get in one of these modes where I'm like, I'm not talking to anybody, I don't want to record, forget the podcast, I at least, if I, I already recorded it, so that means, and I, I, I feel like I have the obligation to, you know, I already did the part, so I already committed to, let's say, interviewing you, I'm going to slide you into episode whatever it is, whatever the last one I did, and slide you right after that one, I'm like, okay, it's done, now Worst case scenario, I don't have to record for the next three weeks because I have three episodes done. Or in this case, a lot of times I have like 10 done. And it's like, that's 10 weeks. That's a long time. That's I'm, I've never had depression for 10 weeks straight. Maybe maybe years and years ago, but not for a long time. So you got to kind of prepare for yourself. You got to work around yourself and you got to know when, like what you're capable of, what you're not, when, when you're at your worst, how does that affect your daily life? How does it affect your job? And then... You know, and then when you do have like the energy and you do do feel like being productive, that's when you just you just double down on the effort. And um, like I said, you're going to have days where you're just going to like, no, screw this job, screw taking care of your brothers, screw showering or whatever it is. And then you and then you have those days, you have your pity party. And then when you wake out of that and then you just come back, a lot of times it's like just shedding your skin. You get a little stronger and boom, you're right back at it and you just put more um, provisions in, in place to, to just kind of continue to deal with yourself. And you just eventually, you kind of just go, okay, this is, this is also a job is dealing with yourself. Um, and yeah, so I think you're doing a really good job. Thank you. I like that idea. Yeah. Like I said, I don't know all of what causes your problems and, you know, your mental issues and, and all that. I don't know how you deal with it, but I'm, you know, I'm sure you're you're better at it than anyone because it's you. You know you. So just continue. Well, to- yeah, that's true because, you know, being able to retire because um, I was diagnosed in my 20s and to be able to complete 30 years of uh, federal service and been going, I'm going on my fourth year as a caregiver for my brother and then my, I'm completing my first year as a business person. So... I, I have to tell myself, oh, you got some, you got some things right. It's been bumpy, but you're still holding on there, and you're gonna figure out this business uh, part of it as well. Right. Uh, I just said I had an accident in um, November of um, 22. I had a, a concussion oh, that has um, affected me. So, um, and then lately I've just been hurt because I fell down my stairs. Jeez. And I tore my uh, meniscus, and I got some another tear somewhere else. I forgot where it is, but I just been like dealing with that. So I've been really mindful of the mental health because you can have some external factors that can trigger us as well, yeah. and take us down that road. And I just refuse to go down that road. But it has been challenging to um, overcome this uh, pain that I'm experiencing in my knee, and I know I got it pretty much get out of it because I really do need to get back to work and yeah. get started on some things and promoting. Um, but I gave myself grace because I didn't do that before. And when I failed twice, um, that was the wake up call that you got to nurture yourself. You got to take care of yourself first uh, in order to take care of the other things that you've made commitments to. So remember Always take care of you first. Make sure you check in with yourself. See how you're feeling. What's going on with you? Yeah. And deal with it. And then go ahead and take on the day. For sure. No, I think you're doing great. And you just got to hang in there, man. Hang in there. And uh, well, I, I've done this with many people on here. But like, if you ever, you ever need a friend, you need someone to talk to about any of this stuff, please reach out. Forget the podcast. Like just in general, you're feeling low, feeling depressed. Just uh, text or call me. I'm around. Um, oh, thank you. We'll get you. We'll get you some more white friends. Uh, uh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Because I have a girlfriend I've known now for what? Oh, twenty years. She lives in Tampa. There you go. See, we're, we're going to get a little more color in your life. Just a little more, right. little more divi- uh, diversity. Um, <laughs> that was something we talked off off air, but yeah. Uh, but anyway. That'd be great. I do really appreciate you. I'm glad what you're doing. Um, do you have a website or anything where they can get the card game? Yes, it says Zochi.com. Can you spell that? Spell, yeah, that spells Z-O-C-H-E-Y. 
why. Zochi. Okay. Awesome. Um, well, again, we will we will talk soon. I'll let you know when the episode comes out. But I thank you for coming on. You were a delight. And um, like I said, you need anything, just just reach out. Thank you for inviting me. Of course, anytime. Okay. Good, good luck and keep healing. All right, you too. The same. Bye. Right, bye. Ah, she's a sweetie. I liked her. Um, but I got something to do, guys. I'm sorry to rush, but I'm going to just jump out of here. But thank you for being on this adventure with her and I, and uh, we'll see you guys later. Bye.